welcome to the Wesley Chapel worship experience. Understand these centering words. All the doubt in the world cannot wash away our inheritance from God. An inheritance of love, refuge, and strength. We want to welcome you to this worship time, to this worship experience. We want to welcome you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are so glad that you can be with us. We're so glad that you can worship with us. And we do trust that God will allow his Holy Spirit to move through you during this time and during this season. We thank God for what God has already done. And we thank God for what God will continue to do even today during worship. Um, I'm just looking forward to the move of the Holy Spirit. I know that this coronavirus and this quarantine time has been a lot on us. And I want to thank you all that are praying for me and let you know that we're praying for you. And I know you've been praying because, you know, God's prayers are being answered and lives are being saved and people are being delivered even in spite of not being in our sanctuaries. We're still in church and we thank God for that. And we thank God for his moving ability. I want to give a special thanks this day for the participants in our worship, our, our bishop and his social media um, offerings and prayer daily. We want to thank God for that, for Bishop Jonathan L. Holston, and we want to thank God for um, Deanna Huff and her special selection, as well as um, Natasha Pegues and her selection. I want to thank God for our, our sermonic participants, the Reverend Marty Quick, the Minister Lyndon Alexander, the Pastor Jerome Hurst Adams, a good friend from Micah and AAMLC. We just want to thank God for their contributions to this worship experience today. For we know God will move and we can trust in our Savior. So thank you once again for being with us at Wesley Chapel. And we just pray that this worship blesses you in a special way. Um, call to worship. Christ indeed is alive. And we're thankful for that. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Even when we struggle to see the good news in the face of poverty and justice and conflict and woundedness, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Glory be to God who has overcome death and given us faith, hope, and love that we can overcome all things. Amen. Amen. And say for tune for the rest. Dear God, we come before your heavenly throne this day as those who love you, O Lord. We sing together with sweet accord, lifting our voices to Zion, O Lord. Use us, O Lord. Use our faith and hope in you to bear your heavenly fruit on this earthly ground. For you are the vine and we are the branches, O Lord. We desire to remain in you, O Lord, to bear fruit fit for your eternal kingdom. O Lord, we are marching upward toward your beautiful city of Zion. Amen.
Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've come today to represent Doubting Thomas. If you will, I will be the defense attorney for Doubting Thomas because I believe and I feel in my heart that Doubting Thomas has gotten a bad rep. But when you look at the history, and I will present this as Exhibit A, there's nothing in the DNA, there's nothing in the evidence of, of Thomas that he was ever afraid. But when we see, we go back to chapter 11 in John when Jesus was going back to see Lazarus and to raise Lazarus and all the disciples were kind of complex and he said, and he pipes up and he said, let us also go that we may die along with Jesus, there's nothing in that statement that says or shows any doubt or that he wasn't a brave man. You understand that, 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 that Thomas was merely social distancing himself, quarantining himself from the disciples who were afraid. Understand that sometimes you, you don't want to get around folks who are scared because that may rub off on you. So he wasn't doubting. He was actually having a moment of doubt. You see, there's a difference when you say that you're doubting Thomas versus a, a doubter versus someone who had doubt. If we all confess that we all have our bad days, especially in the midst of this coronavirus, we've all had our bad moments, but don't let a bad day define our faith walk with Jesus. And the next thing we found Thomas and they said, hey, we have found him, we found him, he's, he's alive. Thomas said, unless I see the marks in his side. Well, Thomas, exhibit A, I mean, exhibit B, Thomas is merely saying that, he's, he's saying N-O because I don't, N-O because I don't K-N-O know enough information. He's merely verifying the information. Kind of like my great-grandfather that raised me, he said, I trust you, son, but I always have to verify it. So then we see a doubting Thomas, he was pouting. Now he's in that moment of doubt, so he's doubting. But oh, we go to look and we see in the next verse when Jesus does come. And Jesus says, put your hands in the mark. And merely all Thomas was asking for were the same things that Jesus showed the disciples. But see, he was out quarantine. He was social distancing from the disciples so he didn't have the opportunity to see what they saw. So exhibit exhibit C that, that Thomas went from, 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 from doubting, pouting to doubting but oh it says in the verse it says when he put his hands in the mark he, he, it said, he, says, in a, he says in a loud voice he says my Lord and my God so that doesn't sound like somebody who was in doubt. That sounds like somebody who had a bad moment, who did not K-N-O-W enough information. But when he got it, he was silent and said, my God, my Lord and my God. And all he wanted was some blessed assurance, as we all need. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Cause all I seem to do is hurt me Hurt me Lord Deliver me yeah. Cause all
John 20, 24 through 29, tells us the story of when Jesus resurrected and he appeared to the disciples and everyone was there but Thomas. So the disciples told Thomas of how they saw Jesus. And Thomas said, unless I can see the nails in his hands and the piercing in his side, will I believe. And so Jesus saw that was so important for Thomas' faith. He did it again. See, it's so important for us to believe. It is so important even in times like this that we have faith in what we know God can do. We, it's important that we have faith in who he is, what he's done, and what he will do. So he appeared to Thomas to renew Thomas and give Thomas some faith that he is God all by himself. Just like he did it for the Ebola, just like he did it for swine flu, just like he did it for the bird flu. We have to know that for coronavirus, Jesus will do it again. Just like he did it for Job, he can do it again for you. Just like he did it for David, it's like he did it for Daniel in the lion's den. He can do it again for you. All we have to do is have faith to understand that Jesus and God can do it again. <laughs> Oh my God, God has delivered us through so much and he brought us through so much. Just like you can use that to be your testimony, to tell somebody else that God can do it again. He can do it just like he did it when I was a young man. He can do it again as an old man. You have to have faith in God that he can do it again. Y'all be blessed, y'all be awesome. Y'all stay safe and understand and believe and know without of a shadow of a doubt that if he did it before, he could do it again. God bless you. Of being in close fellowship with the risen Savior. Listen, there is nothing more that Jesus wants than God wants more than to fellowship with you. It began in the Garden of Eden. The Bible lets us know that in the coolness of the evening, Jesus would come into the garden to fellowship face to face with Adam and Eve. And even after sin, when man, Adam and Eve, tried to hide from God, God still came to the garden searching for them. Adam, where are you? When the children of Israel came out of 400 plus years of of slavery, God told them, build me a sanctuary so that I can be with my people. In the New Testament, the Bible, begin, uh, John starts off, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. His name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. Listen, don't you understand? Jesus wants to fellowship with you. And he says in Revelation, behold, I <clears throat> stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with you. Mm. Listen, here's the last thing I want to tell you. You don't have to be perfect to have Jesus fellowship with you. Remember, these, these boys were doubting. They, they, were, they were downcast as they walked, and they believed Jesus was dead. I mean, they had even heard that he was alive, but they thought it was over, and Jesus comes with them. You remember Zacchaeus, don't you, the tax collector? One of the most notorious criminals of that time, tax collectors. But he desired to see Jesus so much that he climbed up in that sycamore tree. And the Bible says when Jesus saw him, he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I must go to your house today to fellowship with you. You remember in the, throughout the New Testament says that they saw Jesus and Jesus was eating and fellowshipping with the prostitutes and, 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 and all of the wrong crowd, the people from the wrong side of the track. Listen to me. 
You can find hope today. You can find encouragement. There's something that you can hold on to regardless of who you are, regardless of what you have done, regardless of, of, of what your life has been. Jesus wants to fellowship with you. Jesus wants to spend time with you. He wants to spend time so much with you that now he's, he's allowed you to be locked up in your house. The cares of the world are gone. And he says, listen, take this time, these quiet moments, these isolated social distancing moments, but do not allow yourself to become distanced from me. And when we have lost hope, mm, I'm here to tell you hope will come to your house. Jesus is walking hope. Jesus is living hope. And when you've got hope that only Jesus can give, hope overcomes and hope heals and hope restores and hope inspires and hope conquers and hope frees. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus is our hope. Hallelujah. And no matter who you are and where you are, if you will just open your hearts, hope will come to your house and bring you whatever it is that you need. Our scripture for today comes from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, the 19th and following verses. Let's listen for, for the word of God. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fear of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood amongst them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sides. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greetings, Peace to you, just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed on them into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they are gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometime called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told them what they saw. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hand and put my fingers in the nail hole, and stick my hand in his side. I won't believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors and stood amongst them and said, Peace be to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your fingers and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, you believe because you have seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and act and believe, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. The word of God for the people of God. People responded, thanks be to God. Amen. I'm
just a woman Help me believe in what I could be And all that I am Show me the still Let us pray. Dear God that is able, God that is willing and God that can, we ask you, dear God, to show up once again in this place. Deliver, dear God, your children that we may be blessed. God of limited or boundless love, you came into our midst as one who overcame every boundary and barrier even that of death. Move amongst us now. Despite our doubts, breathe resurrection power into the dead places of our heart and strengthen our witness so that others may come to see what we have seen and heard. Amen. Using for very simple subject, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You know, several miles outside of what today is a city called Sinai in India lies a very sacred monument, a memorial called the St. Thomas Mount. It is a traditional place where Thomas the disciple was martyred after having journeyed there to plant one of the earliest churches and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. The courage it took to journey so far from home, to sow seeds of the gospel in what today is South Eastern India must have required great faith. India, Southeast Asia, having a, a combined population even today of two billion people containing neighborhoods of millions of people living together. I, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, as many of us are finding ways of dealing with social distancing, how almost impossible social distancing must be in a place like Sydney, India, where, where people live in, in, in millions of populations and live closely together in tight, unhygienic conditions. Even the most basic protocols are, are warding off and, and washing hands and social distances, all that must be almost impossible for the people that live in India. And yet I, I frame that and, and yet God still made a way with, 
one we would call Doubting Thomas to make his way as St. Thomas to, to, to India to, to reach those people and, and spread the gospel. Ain't God something? Church, today we gather to, to lift once again what God is able to do and where God is able to do it. You know, in India, the churches were not cut down and shut down until March 23rd when the Vatican announced that Holy Week services would be behind closed door. And even then, a lot of folk in India did not take this disease serious. A, a lot of folk in America have still not taken this disease serious. And yet the disease is an example of of what it means to to follow good common sense and to merge together faith as well as our understanding of belief as well as our understanding that God works not only through church buildings and pastors' hands, but God works through the research and the development uh, of scientists and doctors and, and those persons that, that study things like disease and contagions and outbreaks and pandemics. So we, we know that God does work through prayer and meditation. But I think this disease is showing us something else, that God also works. God also works through the hands of science, technology, through the hands of medicine, doctors, episiology. God does work through sickness and death. And we're learning that in new and interesting ways. For isn't that what the Easter season is all about? These 40 days following Easter? Because I know a lot of us think that Easter stops on Easter Sunday, but this is the second Sunday of Easter. We will go through 40, a 40-day 40 period following Easter that the Easter story is told over and over and over again as we finally try to get it. And here we find ourselves in the Doubting Sunday, the Sunday that deals with Doubting Thomas, you know, um, I, I remember a, a quote from Van Gogh, and it's reported that Van Gogh said this, if you hear the voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and the voice will be silenced. Thank goodness Van Gogh kept painting. Chances are some of us are wrestling right now with what it means to have faith because our normal faith, what we normally do for religion, what we normally do for faith has changed. It's all been messed up. So, so what will we do now to show that we believe in God and that we believe in ourselves? Because one of the big things is that we see in the story of Thomas is not just doubt, but self-doubt. Not just self-doubt, but doubt in his community. Not just doubt in his community, but doubt in the leadership and the disciples. Not just doubt in the leadership and the disciples, but doubt in the ability of Christ to overcome death. And all these forms of doubt is what a lot of us are dealing with right now. We know we can do it. We know we should do it. But many of us are refusing to do what we know is best. Doubt is often seen as the opposite of safety. But in John 20, 19 through 31, we see that doubt can be a, a, a pathway that opens up the greatest doors. Just one week after the resurrection, just one week after the celebration, we are faithful to Thomas' story of doubting Thomas. Jesus appears to his disciples and they get to see physical proof of his resurrection. Yet later, when Thomas asked to see proof, because he was not there, when the disciples appeared for the first time, he seems to be chastised by Jesus and our tradition and branded a doubter. But I want to suggest today what Thomas was really doing was just asking Jesus to do it again. And we need to be clear that in life, you're not always going to get a second chance. I know it sounds good. I know it sounds like a fairy tale, and in the fairy tale, 
I know we ne never miss anything. But in real life, sometimes when you refuse to show up, when you refuse to get on a phone call, when you refuse to be on the Zoom meeting, when you refuse to, to be in a number, you will miss something vitally important. And that's real talk. A lot of us are so wrapped up in this COVID-19 and a lot of us are so wrapped up in the, the, the stimulus money and wherever we got it or who got it or what we gonna do with it that we may miss to register for the census this time. Be careful when you miss the group you're supposed to be in. And you would ask the Rev, what does the census have to do with Jesus Christ? Well, I want you to know that sometime you've got to overcome your doubt, your fear, your apprehension and go where you need to be. A few things about doubting and, and I'm going to get all out your way. Um, number one, you got to embrace doubt as, as being heart of being human. We all face doubt. We all go through it. We all live with it. Doubt is real. But even with doubt being real, you've got to understand that you've got to embrace doubt as being a part of you. And when you embrace it and say, yes, I have doubts. Yes, I have fears. Then that is the first step for overcoming those doubts and fears. If Thomas had just said like, the, I'm sure everybody in that room was afraid. The scripture says they had locked the doors. They had closed themselves in. They were almost seemingly hiding, but they were still in the room. They didn't let their fear stop them from being with the Lord. And we can't let our doubt be bigger than who we are. Number two, number two, I'm going to keep moving. Doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. When you find yourself scared to do something or fueled by fear rather than power, you go ahead and doubt the doubt. You go ahead and say, oh, this can't be real. I know God got more for me. I know God can move more mountains than this. I know God is able. I know God is willing. Don't allow your doubt to stop you. You go ahead and doubt your doubt. If, 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 if you're going through something, you say, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to doubt that doubt. If, you, if you're trying to do something for the Lord and you're like, oh, this is impossible, doubt your doubt. Whenever your fear overcomes your willingness to serve, you go ahead and doubt that doubt. Whenever your apprehension keeps you from wanting to do what you know God has called you and equipped you and blessed you and empowered you and put forth a will to do whenever you know that God has set it up. Because I want y'all to know something. God will set up stuff for you. God will put things in place that you can't imagine was lined up. God will line it up. God got God, to God, uh, make somebody call your number when you need something. God got to allow you to open up your eyes and see miracles happen when everybody else is saying miracles are finished. God will heal. God will deliver. God will bring back the dead. God will bring you back from, from, from nothingness. God will wean you off of drugs. Don't let doubt keep you from being in contact with God. You follow God's way and that's the only way that you're going to make it. Hello somebody. Doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. If you ever had everything it takes, then it ain't real. There are some things that you, and you know, good doubt is good sometimes. Because how many of us would be overly inflated? How many of us would be big headed? How many of us would, would be out of this world if we didn't doubt some things? Thirdly, you, you got to make your mission bigger than your fear. What are you saying, Rev? Make your mission bigger than your fear. What have you been called to do? What is your purpose? Why were you designed? Why did God set you up for this? See, if, if all you can focus on is what you don't have, what you hadn't finished, what you hadn't been able to do, you're going to miss it. If all you can focus on is what you've already done, what you've already accomplished. You know, they, they call that navel gazing. 
When all you do is sit back and say, I did this, and I did this, and I did that, and I did this, where are you going? You know, if all you can do is celebrate the few accomplishments you had over and over again, that's a form of narcissism, and, and we know where that will lead. The truth of the matter is, you've got to have a bigger mission than your fear. And fear is real. So how do I get a mission bigger than my fear? I'm glad you asked. You get it from God. God has purpose for each and every one of our lives. And God has set up a beautiful life for each and every one of us. We've got to live into that purpose. We've got to move forward into that purpose. What is the mission that God has given you to do? What is God calling you to do? This is a good time while you're in your house, while you're in quarantine, while you're not working as much, while, while you're wondering and scratching your head and, and you finished Netflix. <laughs> you finished all your TV shows. You, you've watched every videotape and DVD in the house. Well, this is a good time now to talk with the master, to talk with God, to find out where God is leading and directing you. Lastly, I want to challenge you to build a tribe of believers. Part of the problem with Thomas was Thomas had lost his mission because his mission was being a disciple and his mission was going and spreading the good news of the resurrected Christ. His mission was going and telling folk that Jesus Christ was alive and he, did, he wasn't following that mission because he didn't believe that Christ was alive. He had lost hope. He had lost track. He had lost faith, but, but that's where he was. But the other thing is he had lost his tribe. He had lost his group. He was not in the disciples. Hello, somebody. People keep telling me, uh, uh, Rev, 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 we can't stand not being in the church. I miss the church. Do you miss the church? I mean, do you literally miss the, the pews and the seats and the mics and the lights and all of that? Or do you miss the people? Because you can miss the church. But you don't have to miss the people. If those believers in the church are truly your friend, reach out and call, reach out and send a letter, find a way to get in contact with them. Someone told me, said, well, some of the people don't have Facebook. Well, well, you write down notes from the sermon and you call them and tell them this is what the sermon was about. If they can't get on the conference call for Sunday school, you, you find a way to write down notes in Sunday school. Mark your Sunday school book. When you get out of Sunday school or off the phone call, you call them and say, hey, let me tell you how God moved during the Sunday school lesson this morning. Let me tell you what the pastor said. I know you're not on Facebook. I know you're not on YouTube. I know you're not on Zoom, but but I, I got the word and I'm passing the word. If they really your friends, you'll tell them about it. If you're really your friend, if they're in your tribe, if they're in your group of belief, doubting Thomas, Thomas had lost his faith because he lost his group. He ran away from his disciples. He wasn't with them. And whenever you get away from your disciples, whenever you get away from your boys, whenever you get away from your family, if you try to do this thing out on your own, it will not work. And when you get away from your church family, you're going to fall flat on your faith. You need somebody to support you in this walk we're about. We need one another. And one of the things I hope to do this week, and I, uh, maybe we'll grow next week, but I want to reach out to some of my clergy colleagues because I need their prayers and their preaching. I don't know about you, but I, I spent Easter Sunday between the food, because we did eat. Y'all y'all know I ate. But between the food, I, I spent Easter Sunday listening to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after song after song after song. And my soul was done good. Because all that singing and all that preaching, I, I never get that on Easter. But it helped renew in me a hope, a, a spirit of change. And I needed it. Because if you've been watching what's been going on, you, 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 you've heard that 
racism is peeking out and 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 poverty is showing up in the midst of this disease and quarantine because people were already sick people already had ailments and now with the quarantine and now with the disease spreading it's the poorest communities it's the poorest people it's those folk that were already sick, already had high blood pressure and diabetes. It's the African-American community that was already struggling, that is winding up being at the top of the death rolls and death lists because they already didn't have it. They didn't have hospitals in our community. We didn't have doctors in our community. We didn't have capable ways of living and getting through any situation in our community. And now now it's being highlighted. The disease is shining a light on our already suffering. We didn't know we were suffering the way we were suffering. But now with this disease, we're seeing just how bad life is. And we would be able to, to hide in a, a far off room or, or run away from our group. But don't be like that. You come back and see that Jesus can do it again. See, church, that's where we are. We need to understand when we get with our folk, when we get with our people, that Jesus can do it again. That Jesus can do it again. What, what, what can he do, Rev? You know, one of the most beautiful things about Jesus that people often miss is as he was going to Jerusalem and as he was being championed, he, he left and went to the temple and turned over the tables. Why is that key, Riff? Because just like Jesus turned over the tables during the biblical narrative, Jesus can do it again. And he can turn over the tables of injustice, of racism, of prejudice, of hatred, of bigotry, of sexism. Jesus can do it again. Just like Jesus doing his resurrection turned the world upside down and let the world know that life comes from God and not from man, that man has no control over life or death, but only God has control over life or death. Jesus can let us know once again during the midst of this virus that God is still in control, that God is still overpowered over life and death that God can do it again. That's what Jesus does. Jesus shows us that God is in power, that God is in control, that God has all power, that God has all control, that God can do it over and over and over and over and over again, that God can do it again and again and again. Oh, some of us think that we were saved and, and filled with grace, but we fell off the track. We fell off the tractor. We fell off the plan. We got out of whack. We fell out of control. But let me know. Let me let me tell you something about my God, about my Lord. He can do it again. Just like he pulled you out of the muck and mire the first time. He can pull you out again. Some folk think, well, I, I, I don't know what to do now because I don't have faith like I used to have. But God that brought you to faith the first time can bring you to faith again. Oh, yes. Somebody need to say again. Again, somebody need to realize he can do it again. Somebody need to realize that God cannot give up on you because you don't need to give up on God. Understand that Easter season is all about God being able to do it again. Understand that Thomas, Thomas, the one we looking down on, the one we putting down on right now, um, Thomas. After being coming and encountering God again, after feeling the whole, yes, Jesus said that the better miracles are coming to those that believe without seeing. But Thomas got an eye full, a handful. Thomas, Thomas was empowered again. Church, God can empower you again. That same faith 
you had when you first started on this journey is available to you again. That same hope you had when you first joined church is available to you again. That same faith that you had when you first saw Jesus is available to you again. Will you reach out? Will you reach forward for what God has for you? Let us pray. Go and be a witness because of those who risked and journeyed, struggled in love. Go be a witness to what God's love can do in the world to overcome broken systems, strained relationships, and human greed. Go in love, grace, and peace that God gives. And may we be the church in a hurting world. Amen. Where are you?